So that kind of gets us on to a final summary slide on how we've uh, looked at uh, things that are eliminated in the course of moving through these different paradigms. What I've got here uh, represented is a sense of series of bar, bar charts. The length of the bars essentially represents the money or time associated with a series of tasks. So uh, if you have task one, task two, on on through a series of tasks that are necessary to convert a series of materials or products into a final uh, sub-assembly or a final assembly or product. Then when Taylor looked at it, the organizational issues and the control issues were number one in his mind. Merchant essentially identified a bunch of externalities that didn't add value, took those out of the cycle so you could increase the production rate, oops, reduce the, um, reduce the production time, and essentially focus on value added. Toyota essentially said, uh, Toyota essentially said, we're going to ignore the little pointer for a minute because that's causing problems here. Toyota essentially said, let's take a look at the supply chain externalities in terms of, of quality issues that cause us to add redundancy or, or lag time to our process, increase the lead time to the process, and let's guarantee that those don't play a role. So we see this shrinking of activity, time and, and money to manufacture, while we're saying that in that little blue bar, even though it's getting smaller, we're making the same amount of product or more, and the cost per product is dropping. And the last little connection is to remove the environmental externalities, which essentially allows us to account for reduced costs due to what is now currently the, so the social burden of doing this, but is, is becoming more and more the manufacturer's burden of doing that. And at the same time, of course, reducing waste, reducing energy use, reducing impacts, reducing requirements for, for other kinds of characteristics to handle and process kind of the results of our manufacturing process, which goes right to the bottom line. So the idea then is to now move along and figure out how we can talk a little bit about what this present paradigm shift means in terms of uh, green or sustainable manufacturing. So we're going to switch over to that part of our, our discussion. I use this kind of ripple pond idea because it's sort of a neat thing. It's, it's you know, representative of something that happens at the center and the ripples spread out and have much wider impacts than you're really anticipating and you have to think about how these waves affect you and what other people's waves are doing and how they might affect you. Really, what we're trying to do is, for all of the people that are listed in this um, little list here, is how to figure out and characterize, quantify, measure, control what our actions do and how they impact others, and how the impacts of others, or how the actions of others impact me and my business or my company or my product. So upstream supply chain of issues, downstream supply chain issues. And I would argue that if you take a close look at all of these things, just like uh, Taylor and Merchant and Toyota did, you can find opportunities relative to environment, energy, sustainability, as we're going to be defining it, that allow improvements that will extract unnecessary cost, waste, redundancy, and add tremendous value to the uh, process that you're instituting, and you will be rewarded for that uh, by your customers and by market share and by the ability to operate in regions that, that uh, pay much attention to these kinds of things. It really is coming. These waves are coming. It's a bit of a, it's not quite a tsunami yet, but there's certainly ripples that are, are making things move up and down, and the question is, are we prepared for it? And that's really what we hope uh, gets you into the, you know, the first level or second level of Everett and Jones. Are you going to be taking action? Are you going to be <clears throat> watching what's going on? Or are you, in fact, going to be um, uh, just kind of trying to figure out how you, got, uh, how you got whacked by something that you didn't see coming? An interesting way to look at this, and this kind of a holistic view was put forward by RICO, a company that makes copying machines, back in 1994. And they call it the Comet Circle. And what it is, if you look at the top end of the Comet Circle, moving from material supplier towards the left at the top of the screen, you see essentially the upstream supply chain going from where your materials come, how they are converted into raw materials that are used for manufacture of, of pieces and bits and, and sub-assemblies, how they fit into the product that you manufacture, how they go through your sales scheme, and finally how they go to the user, whether that's someone in a house, whether that's someone in a company, whether it's a government, whether uh, it's a manufacturer who's using that product to make other products. 
The bottom portion of the cycle moving clockwise comes out of the user, and the lowest level sort of is what goes in sort of the least efficient type of recovery of resources, it goes to collection, recycling, maybe shredder, maybe it gets burnt, maybe it gets landfilled, uh, who knows what happens. And the whole idea that Rico was trying to talk about with respect to a comet circle and a sustainable circle is the, the more direct you can return the resource from the user back to the user, either through the first loop, which is maintenance and return. The second use would be product recovery and sort of resell and reuse. The third loop would be parts recovery, remanufacture and reuse. The third loop further out would be materials recovery into parts and then remanufacture, then sales. The closer you are to the user, the tighter this content is, the less energy resources being used to reuse the product, the more green the process is, and if we define it correctly, the more sustainable the business model is. This is not easy. This is challenging. This requires us to think about this at the design level all the way through to the, to the manufacturing level and all of the intermediate pieces, transport, energy mix where you're manufacturing the component, uh, what kind of maintenance you use, what kind of service structure you have to make sure that this works. But it's important. Most times we talk about the green supply chain, and it's the lower portion. It's what happens after the user is done with the product and how you get rid of it and get it back into some productive use or at least productive material stream or at least minimize the trashing of the thing. But the argument is you really have to think about the forward supply chain, what's coming into your system, because that really determines how tight that loop is relative to the user. It determines whether it comes in close or whether it comes in at some further loop where there's more and more energy and resource used to kind of get it back to the uh, get it back to the user. So the concept of sustainability then raises its head in the sense of definitions and how we kind of put that in context of manufacturing, which is important for us to think about because uh, unless we can actually map this down onto our own domain, this is all a rather esoteric concept. There's a lot of definitions of sustainability. This is one I think that's got the kind of the most uh, miles under its tires. It was put to forth by the United Nations back in '83. It deals with sustainable development, but we can relate that to manufacturing or life. It basically says that we have to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So I tell that to students, and they say, "That's wonderful." What does that mean with respect to whether I should study calculus or material science or chemistry? So you've got to kind of hone in on this a little bit. A further question is, if it's green, is it sustainable? How green does it have to be to be sustainable? You know, can we define sustainable manufacturing? Is it an oxymoron? Is any manufacturing sustainable? So these are sort of trajectories that we're looking at, long-term goals, not sort of quarterly feedback on how we're doing, long-term goals on how we're achieving this. And part of our objective here is to define some metrics that we can use to point us in the right direction and make sure that if we believe what we've talked about so far, we can keep moving along this path towards sustainable and sustainable development. 